phenomenological investigation of action and through a reflexive act of appropriation. In short, I will argue that Ricoeur's appeal to a fait primitive refers directly back to Maine de Bron's analysis of the inner experience of the will, um, which uh, he talks about in various writings, the journal, the essay on the foundations of psychology, on habit in the faculty of thinking. And the subsequent development of this theme in Felix Ravizone's Ontology of Act and Habit, in the influential work, work of Habit, and John Hebert's concept of original affirmation, um, i.e. the self's effort to exist and the desire to be, which he develops in ele elements for an ethics. Um, as I just mentioned, the, the task today has been shortened mainly to the first. Uh, in this way, I hope to show the deep roots of Ricoeur's engagement with and critique of the Anglo-American analytical, analytical philosophy and the French tradition of reflexive philosophy. In his intellectual autobiography, in the, in the philosophy of Paul Ricoeur, uh, Ricoeur recounts his indebtedness to the French tradition of reflexive philosophy. In 1933 to 34, Ricoeur wrote his master's thesis on the problem of God in La Chalie and Lagneau. Uh, though the thesis concerned the problem of the relation of faith and reason, Ricoeur writes that, quote, the real benefit of this passage by way of, of La Chalier and Lagneau lay elsewhere. He explains, as a quote from Ricoeur here, through, through them I had been initiated and even assimilated into, into the tradition of French reflexive philosophy. On the one hand, this tradition led back through Boutreau and Ravazone to Maine de Baron. On the other hand, it tended toward John Nebert, who in 1924 had published uh, the, inner ex ex the Interior Experience of Liberty, a work that placed him somewhere between Bergson and Brunschweig. John Nebert was to have a decisive influence on me in the 1950s and 1960s. It is not too much to say that the style of Nebert's reflexive philosophy, while rooted in the thought of Fichte, is decisively shaped by the unique form of reflexive philosophy inaugurated by Maine de Baron and developed by Ravazone. In turn, Nebert's distinctive form of reflexive philosophy provided the basis for her Ricoeur's hermeneutical transformation of Husserlian phenomenology in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, although references to Nebert uh, in Ricoeur's writings uh, drop off in the 1970s and 1980s, it is my reading that Nebertian reflexive philosophy provides the encompassing arch architectonic infrastructure of his major works, Time and Narrative and Oneself as Another. In today's presentation, I attempt to show the impact of Maine de Baron on studies three and four of oneself as another, Ricoeur's critical engagement with the semantic analyses of action and intention by Anscombe and Davison. The argument there, boils, boiled down to its essence, proceeds as follows. In her um, ordinary language analysis of, of action, Anscombe follows Wittgenstein's prohibition in the philosophical investigations against private language games and appeals to internal mental entities as the grounds of meaning. Meaning for followers of Wittgenstein is composed of public language games, language used in the context of human action and general practices that comprise the human form of life. The meaning of a sentence is, is how it is used in a language game. This seems to rule out any appeal to a phenomenology of decision and intention underlying human action and the power to act. Therefore, as Ricoeur reads Anscombe's famous work on intentional action, titled simply Intention, the analysis of the meaning of human action must be based on the publicly observable, quote, accomplished action, which avoids any appeals to um, internally observable mental entities. But as Ricoeur notes with interest, Anscombe further agrees that there is a basic distinction between knowing how or the practical knowledge involved in, the, in such basic actions as the gesture of raising one's hand in order to point and knowing that the, the theoretical knowledge of things and events in the world knowable through observation. Practical know-how of action is according to Anscombe, a knowledge, quote, a knowledge without observation. 
Ricoeur thinks this affirmation of this practical knowledge affirms a basic awareness, though unthematized and untheorized, of something like the Baranian primitive datum of the I can. But the Baranian path is blocked to Anscombe, who follows the Wittgensteinian prohibitions against appeals to inter introspection as the ground of meaning. But we know that, for Ricoeur following Baran, another path exists. Not all phenomenology of inner experience is introspection. Baranian reflection reveals a basic non-representative awareness of the agency of the self accompanying human action. Because the only kind of reflection Anscom can imagine is psychological introspection, thematization of this kind of phenomenological awareness is cut off in her analysis of intentional action. Based on this key insight, step by step, Ricoeur's argument unfolds. First, Anscom focuses on the publicly observable accomplished action. In this way, she privileges the what of intentional action, i.e. the completed action. She distinguishes intentional action as a, quote, making something happen from a physical event or a happening. Uh, events have causes, actions have motives. Motives are analyzed as the, as the quote, why of the what of action. Motives are reason, reasons for something, for, for a human action, reasons or wantings that render an action intelligible and distinct from a physical event. Thus, desires by themselves are more on the order of physical causes. Against this neat separation of motives from causes, Ricoeur, drawing on his arguments in freedom and nature, contends that motives can, can best or only be understood in terms of a mixed discourse of reasons and force. Since they involve freedom and affectivity, the involuntary and the, volunt and the, voluntary and the involuntary. Ricoeur next turns to Anscombe's analysis of the word intention in ordinary language. Here the core of Ricoeur's argument appears and will, I argue, and will rely, I argue, upon the phenomenology of the Brownian primitive datum. Ricoeur discovers that Anscombe deprivileges the future-oriented perspective or, quote, declarative intention, or what Anscombe also calls the intention to. So it's the future-oriented case of intention, uh, or ordinary language um, cases of intention. As somehow derivative in meaning from what Ricoeur calls the adverbial usage of the intention with which of an, of an accomplished action. Uh, this omission conceals the place where the primitive datum is most phenomenologically evident in the self-binding decision of oneself committing oneself uh, to an action, or to use Ricoeur's old, older terminology, the project, which simultaneously terminates the examination of motives and reasons. This Ricoeur calls at one point, the intention of, in, of the intention, or the pure act of intending, that underlies the publicly observable what of the intention with which um, that the completed action is done. Because of, this, um, the dependence of the, because of this dependence of the what of action on the who uh, is concealed and forgotten in the Anscomian and subsequent uh, Davidsonian analysis. In turn, this move conceals the, the personal ontology of the I can, or the mindness of the decision and initiative that's discussed in the following chapter. Finally, in Anscombe's privileging of the intention with which, or the pub publicly observable what, why of action, opens the door for Davidson to assimilate the ontology of intentional action to an, to an ontology of impersonal events within his, within his theory of anomalous monism, making actions a subclass of events and motives or reasons for a subclass of causes. And we end up with motive causes and action events paired alongside with regular causes and regular events. Davison's theory of action as event leads to a final concealment of the who of action by the what of action. Anscombe's knowing how, a practical knowledge without observation, catches sight of the phenomenology of the I can, but quickly deflects and deforms this into the what and the why of action. 
Anscombe omits the who of action, um, that is the personal I who decides based on my motivations, originating in and through my incarnate existence, and commits myself to carrying out the action in the future, but in her attending solely to the objective side of action or the what. This omission on Recur's reading allows the person or the Asian to drop out of the analysis of action. Davison exploits the impersonal character of the, of the account in his treatment of the topic. These systematic omissions permit a, a more profound ambiguity, ambiguity in the analyses to go unnoticed, one that a Barani analysis can help draw out. Bodily mo movements are characterized as impersonal events, but this character, characterization relies upon viewing the body as a possession, a having of the person, and not as who the person is in his or her incarnate existence. The body is just another object in the world, not the being of the person who acts um, or the agent's incarnate existence. And here you can hear echoes of Marcel, Baran, and then uh, more objectifiably, Strassen. Ricoeur attuned, attuned to this distinction between incarnate existence and having a body by the reflexive, French reflexive tradition is acutely aware of these ambiguities. Davidson's reduction of intention to the intention with which one performs an action obscures the essentially personal dimension of intentional action, even while trading on it at key points in his theory. In the language of Gabriel Marcel, the problem of intentional action is reduced to a problem rather than a mystery, thereby fundamentally eclipsing the enigma of the acting and suffering human being that forms the recurring basis of each successive study of oneself as another. And now I'm going to turn, because I've been talking a lot about this Barani and primitive datum, to try to give an attempt at explaining what this is and Baran's unique idea of reflection. So this is called the primitive datum in the third and fourth studies of oneself as another. But you'll see I'm also alluding to the last study of oneself as another. In oneself as another, Ricoeur does not use the term primitive datum until the fourth study, from action to the agent. In the, in the third study, he refers only to an underlying phenomenology of the future-oriented aspect of intentional action that remains hidden in the Anscombian Davidsonian analyses, which leads to the, what he calls the occultation or concealment of the who of action and the submersion of the problem of ascription. The argument seeks, ascription is Ricoeur's technical term for ascribing action to an agent. Uh, the argument seeks rather to uncover an, an aporia. It is a negative argument, so speaking of study number three. The fourth study provides the positive argument. And here he identifies a, quote, primitive datum of the power of acting underlying the phenomenon of, of decision. And there he's describing in terms of Aristotelian proiresis or preferential choice. Uh, we should note that the two facets of the power of acting discussed in the fourth study, decision and then um, initiative, which forms the, the central category of that uh, uh, study, perfectly parallel. Uh, so those two, uh, decision and initiative, perfectly parallel the basic analysis of the will that, that structures the first two parts of his earlier work, Freedom and Nature, the Voluntary and the Involuntary, the first volume of Ricoeur's um, incomplete three-part philosophy of the will. Of the will. Ricoeur modeled his analysis of the will in Freedom and Nature on the structure of Husserl's um, uh, meaning intention and fulfilling intention as this, this paired concept outlined in the logical investigations. Uh, first, number one, the act of deciding intends the pro project. So this is like the meaning intention. Deciding is the noetic act. The project is the noema of this intentional act underlying action human action, using the Husserlian terminology. The decision depends on me, is based on my motives, and was within my power, and out of the history of the temporal genesis, the duration of decision, emerges this meaning structure of, of, the, of the decision aiming at the act. Number two, this is the fulfilling act. 
The act of moving one's body aims at the pragma, the thing to be done by me in the world that fulfills the project. And so if you can see here, this is the, what we have in oneself is another in the first study, decision and initiative are, are mirroring that same structure back in freedom and nature. In this earlier text, both the meaning intention and fulfilling intention are dependent moments of the concrete power of acting. Similarly, in oneself as another, preferential choice and initiative together make up the concrete reality of the power of acting. So in my reading, uh, or the term primitive, or jumping ahead here, the term primitive datum refers throughout, occurs throughout freedom of nature repeatedly, especially when Recur describes the relation of a phenomenology of effort that underlies both decision and movement, which is then called initiative in oneself as another. But he always, it's always in reference to Maine de Baron's phenomenology of, of effort and the acting incarnate itself. On my reading then, since the third and fourth studies of oneself as another are related as negative and positive forms of an, uh, sides of the argument, when he refers to the phenomenology of the future-oriented aspect of intention in the third study, he implicitly points ahead to the primitive datum of the power to act discussed explicitly in the fourth study. I do not believe that Ricoeur casually tosses around this terminology of the fet primitive, the primitive datum. Whenever he employs the term, he always means it by it a direct reference to the French tradition of reflexive philosophy, intending specifically the Brownian usage of the phrase and its similar usage in the writings of Ravizon and Jean Nebert. To be clear, Ricoeur pursues a hermeneutical variant of the Baranian primitive datum. Baran himself in his writings sometimes slips into the language of a raw datum, of some, something he sometimes calls a hyper-organic force. Properly speaking, for Ricoeur, there can be no reflexive intuition of this primitive datum as a discrete raw datum or object of experience. As I re read Ricoeur, this primitive datum is a non-intentional awareness that accompanies the power of acting as a concrete whole, most prominently expressed in effort. The experience can be recovered, that is attested to, as a feeling of assurance, of the assurance of being oneself, acting and suffering, uh, recurs definition of attestation, only through an effort of interpretation across the entire arc of action, and you know, finally across the entire arc of oneself as another, encompassing the temporal formation of the motive, decision, project, project, effecting movement in the world through one's lived body. Ricoeur sums this up in the fourth study, remarking on the connection of this hermeneutical recovery of the phenomenology underlying the power of decision and initiative and the recovery of, and, and there he's talking about this re recovery of a pre-modern conception of efficient causality. I'm just gonna read an extended quote here uh, where he says this. However, re restoring efficient causality for the sole benefit of ascription of the action to the agent may well appear a weak argument, as does any appeal to something as a primitive datum. I am not rejecting the notion of a primitive datum, Recur writes, at a much later stage of, the invest of investigation, when he, and by this I think he's referring to the try to passivity, the flesh alterity of the other person and conscience in the concluding uh, uh, section of the final 10th study. I shall, he says, I shall oppose or set in opposition the modest avowal of a few primitive data inherent in the con construction of a, f of a fundamental anthropology uh, to the Promethean ambition of ultimate foundation based upon the model of the Cartesian cogito and, is, and in successively more radical formulations. So he's gonna say, I'm gonna oppose these primitive datum to this, you know, uh, 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 Husserl's um, Promethean ambitions. One must not surrender one's arms, however, without a fight, he says. This is why I want to give the, the form of a, an aporia to the admission that the agent's power of acting is in the final analysis to be considered a primitive datum. A primitive datum does not mean a raw datum. Quite the opposite. A primitive datum should be recognized only at the end of a labor of thinking, a dialectic, that is, a conflict of arguments, which has been uh, developed rigorously. If a primitive datum is not a raw datum, what is, then what is it? I believe we can gain some purchase on this 
negative claim by turning to Main Day Baran's concept of the primitive datum, which as we shall see is directly, directly related to the idea of the lived body. Uh, so this section is called Baranian Reflection, the Primitive Datum, and the Own Body. In the last section of One Self is Another, Ricoeur speaks of, quote, the original correlation between acting and suffering, that, uh, that the, the cor corporeal anchorage of the own body or flesh uh, 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 provides. This section, which is the final section of the concluding 10th study of One Self as Another, which is entitled What Ontology in View, where he's developing his ontology of act, and then also this ontology of, of the I can, is entitled Selfhood and Otherness. So it's the, I'm looking at the final section of the final concluding study. In this section, Mercure conducts a phenomenological investigation into three fundamental forms of passivity, each of which, in their own way, attests to a form of otherness. These three forms of passivity are Number one, the flesh or one's own body or the, or the experience of the passive side of the self's incarnate existence, which mediates the self's active relation to the world. Number two, the alterity of the person, the passivity which mediates the self's relation to other persons. And number three, the moral conscience um, in the sense of the Heideggerian Gewissen um, and the Heideggerian idea of metaphor of the calling voice of conscience, which mediates the self's relation to itself. If I had a longer paper, I would develop this idea of the primitive datum at each step of the way, that there's a primitive datum, the self's assurance of acting, even in the self's relation to the self, in, in the moral conscience. And that would be by drawing on Jean Hébert. Um, irreducible one to another, this triad of passivity, as Ricoeur names it, attests to a polysemic form of otherness within the meta-category of the great kind, the other, which is to say that otherness is itself always other than itself. Nevertheless, these three forms of passivity seem to comprise an exhaustive set of the self's fundamental relations, namely the relations of self to world, self to other persons, and self to itself. And I, parenthetically, I would take the self's relation to God to be included in, this, in the voice of conscience, the other that mediates the self's relation to itself, and thus the two other relations, self-world and self-other persons. In any case, to get, today I wish to focus on the first form of passivity, the passivity of one's own body or the flesh, always keeping in mind that such a bracketing of the last two relations renders the analysis incomplete, abstract, and partial. The self or occurs is first an acting and suffering self, a personal reality individuated in the world through its incarnation into the lived body. Ricoeur states that, quote, one's own body becomes, becomes the emblematic title of a vast inquiry which denotes the entire <coughs> sphere of intimate passivity and hence of otherness for which it forms the center of gravity. This inquiry, Ricoeur says, leads from Main de Baran up to the meditations of Gabriel Marcel, a Merleau-Ponty, and then Michel Henry on embodiment, the flesh, affectivity, and self-affection, unquote. According to Ricoeur, the reception of Baranian thought in these later philosophers is mediated by way of Edmund Husserl's phenomenology of the flesh and passive syntheses. Uh, in his discussion of one's own body, the flesh, Ricoeur focuses first on Main de Baran before turning to an exhaustive examination of the Husserlian concept of the flesh. This is significant because it is Baran who claims that the experience of acting and the power to act is, quote, a primitive datum within a radically imminent sphere of intimate, uh, intimate sense, irreducible to forms of givenness of transcendent objects. Uh, according to Ricoeur, Baran discovers in his analysis of the lived body an ontology of act that cannot be reduced to an ontology of substance. According to Baran, Ricoeur explains, the existence of the human being, or quote, the I am, is fundamentally one of, quote, I want, I live, I do, unquote. Ricoeur calls this ontology of act existence. In other words, there is no apprehension of the self's existence of the I am apart from acting and suffering in the lived body. In all acting, there is a self-apperception of the self-acting that cannot be reduced to any ob objectivizing 
representation. And this is the key point that uh, Ricoeur keeps coming back to. And crucially for Ricoeur's argument in oneself as another, the self in acting experience a, quote, non-representative certainty, unquote, of the self's acting. In an important footnote, um, on page 321, footnote 26, to his discussion of Baran, Ricoeur describes this self-awareness as an, quote, intimate sense, Baran's term, that, properly speaking, has no object. I believe this form of non-representational or non-intentional certainty forms the core basis of Ricoeur's epistemology of attestation, developed and deepened successively throughout oneself as another. This primitive datum of oneself acting falls outside of the certainty and doubt of any verificationist epistemology. It can always be doubted because it is non-observational by its very nature. However, the self possess possesses an assurance of, of a non-intentional awareness of this self-relation in acting that is, as Ricoeur states, akin to the intersubjective epistemology of veracity and trust. In trusting the promise given by another person, do I really place this kind of certainty, this trust, on a lower epistemological scale or level than the certainty of observation? Is it possible to doubt that oneself, or the ipse self, acts in the living experience of acting? Ricoeur argues that it is the substantial self, the supposed self of Edom identity, or sameness, or whatness, that is truly under consideration when philosophers and religious thinkers say that the acting self can or should be doubted. And so you can think of you know, his analysis of Parfit, and so forth. And here he follows Baran. In his book on Main de Baran, Philosophy and Phenomenology of the Body, uh, Michel Henri argues that Baran conceives the body as a subjective body. And this subjective body co coincides with an ontological realm of radical imminence different from the ontology of any transcendent object of intentionality. This is a realm of, quote, intimate sense accessible to a special form of reflection. And this is the point of the paper. There's a special form of reflection that is distinctive of French reflexive philosophy in this particular tradition. Henry warns readers that Baran's that Baran's understanding reflection is radically different from the usual understanding of reflection in reflexive philosophy, whether one has in mind Descartes, Kant, or Fichte. Whatever the usual construals of Fichte in reflexive philosophy, in my judgment, it may be that Baran has come across the truer or deeper understanding of Fichte and self-positing. In any case, a century later, John Nebert whom some have called the French Fichte, certainly adopted a Baranian inflection in his understanding of Fichte's notion of self-positing and striving, as is, as is evident in Hebert's notion of original affirmation mm -hmm. underlying um, our, quote, effort to exist and desire to be. So again, we have this language of effort that's coming from Baran. Ricoeur himself, I believe, adopts this Baranian reading of Nebert's concept of the effort to exist. So what precisely is the Baranian notion of reflection and existence, and how are they related? Um, first of all, Baran identifies the subjective body as the cogito itself. There is no self or I outside of the body because the self knows itself through acting and moving. Henry writes, quote from Henry here, reflection is identified as the original source of all evidence, which is, which is the cogito such as Baran understands it, i.e. not a reflective and intellectual act, but, but an action, effort, a movement. Reflection is a kind of immediate apperception of the self's activity or striving. Baran identified the self with the active pro productive force of acts. The ego knows itself in its activity, um, re and here in its reflection in an immediate sense. Quote from uh, Baran, our intimate sense is the most perfect manner of knowing, the only one which is truly immediate. Through, uh, through this intimate sense, we become aware of this radically imminent, non-intentional, non-representative certainty, which he calls uh, the fait primitive, primitive datum. But this is not a mental reflection. So now this is 
connecting back to the critique of Anne Scowen Davison. It's not a mental reflection or introspection or interior observation that turns back and, and takes its own activity as objects. This kind of reflection, i.e. Reflect, reflecting as introspection, is possible, but it immediately transforms the imminent activity and experience into just one more transcendent object. In this case, Baran holds, a quote from Baran, the ego is, in all truth, is objectivated in an individu individual image rather than conceived in the reflective and unrepresentable idea which is proper to him. Braun writes another quote here, are there not thoughts, intimate volitions, which can in no way be read from without or represented by any sort of image? To conceive them, would it not be necessary that they identified with the active and knowingly productive force of such, such acts, with the ego itself, which, is, which, fe which, itself, which feels itself and is aware of itself in its operations, but which in no way sees itself as an object, in no way uh, imagines itself as a phenomenon. Um, so what I do here is go on to, to um, uh, provide a little bit more context uh, with Baran. And uh, so I'll just, re I'll just read a couple more uh, short um, quotes from Baran. Before th this proposition, he's referring here to Descartes, I think I exist can be expressed by these separate signs, I think, exists. The existence of the I is given in an internal apperception or an immediate intuition. The intellectual act, which unites thought and existence as inseparable attributes of the essence of the subject I, is an intuitive judgment. The latter relies upon signs. The intuition is independent thereof. And so he says that uh, Descartes was glimpsing the idea, but again transforms it into a what. Um, Another quote, the old identity between being and substance, which, Des or this is actually a quote from Ricoeur. The old identity between being and substance, which Descartes in no way questioned, rests on exclusive privilege according to the quasi-visual representation, which transforms things into a spectacle, into images grasped at a distance. Descartes' doubt is a doubt about the spectacle of things. And if Descartes, if Descartes can doubt that he has a body, is because he has given himself an image of it that doubt easily reduces to a dream. This is no longer the case if self-apperception is taken as an apperception of an act and not the deduction of a substance. And so what I go on in the, in the rest of the paper is to kind of, is, is just to kind of elaborate this idea that, that just as uh, uh, Ricoeur is criticizing Descartes, the same argument applies um, uh, to Anscombe and Davison when they turn action into the what of action. They reduce the pure act of intending, or what he calls the intention of intention. They focus on the, the intention, the observable intentional action that results either, either in the physical act in the world or in the mental act of having the, the project or intention. And they forget this original act that, that we have an inner experience of. Um, so I'll just wrap it up there. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. And we need to make time for Adam here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. It's a fascinating paper. And um, I think you're on something really important here, although I don't really know enough about what the philosophy say that you wrote about that. My question is whether you think that there is any tension between Ricoeur's debts to this tradition and certain other tendencies in his thought. And what I have in mind is uh, I think of Ricoeur as a philosopher of mediation. Par excellence and the philosopher of detours. And do you think of this importance um, that's attached to immediate, to the immediate, um, you might stand attention? Well, this is, I mean, I, let me just say for, uh, right away that this, this appeal to immediacy, you know, um, I, I actually went undergraduate, went to uh, College St. Olaf, and my professor was a, um, a, a, a devotee of Wittgenstein. He studied with Anscombe and von Richt, and so I kind of imbibed the, the drank the Kool-Aid of Wittgenstein. Um, and so it kind of goes against what's been bred in my bones to appeal to some immediacy or phenomenology of, an, of inner experience. Um, but if you, 
if you think of it not as a, and this is that middle section of the paper I was talking about, it's only after the work, the labor of interpretation, after you go through those dialectics, after you engage all the um, signs of the effort to exist that have been deposited in the world and in text narratives and so forth, using the Neighboring language. It's only after you go through all of that that you can come back and reappropriate, which is Recur's language. In his, early, in his earlier period, he would talk about concrete reflection as the second part of it. In the middle part, he would talk about appropriation. Well, now, later on, he's talking about attestation. And so the way I think about it is not as this, and, and this would be a criticism, I think, of Braun. Braun talks sometimes as if, you know, you just wake up in the morning and everyone knows this, right? You know, um, although, you know, if, you, if you've ever had the effort of trying to get out of bed um, when your alarm goes off, you, maybe you are experiencing something like this. But um, it's only after the labor of, of reflection or of, of interpretation that then a secondary reflective act, and this is more of the Niberian aspect of it, allows you to reappropriate this. So I would call it more something like an a mediated immediacy. And that, that would be some, that was part of the later part of the paper. I don't think I'm getting quite to your question, mm -hmm. but, but it's something like that. Um, and this is kind of, my, I've been kind of on the trail of this with Ricoeur. What is, how can he be saying this? Because you know that footnote on page 321, there's no doubt in my reading that he's agreeing with this. How can he say this and be the philosopher of mediation par excellence, which I think is what you're referring to. I don't, that, does that yeah, get to your question? Yeah, so far as to say that the immediate is kind of an endpoint rather than a, a point of departure? Well, it's, it's something that you, it's, inco, it's, so, it's inchoate, uh, so it's, it, can, it can be missed. But once, what, if you appropriate it, it becomes a, a certainty. So I wouldn't want to say it's like the end point at, at the end of some, you know, long, you know, what, Hegelian Aufhebung or something like that. I think it's, it's always there, but it's always open to kind of this uh, suspicion. Um, and uh, if I had more time in the paper, I would have done that discussion that he does with initiative, where he goes through the Kantian antinomies and actually draws out a, a, a mediating position, mediation again, where there is a, a point where he says that there can be a freedom, an act of initiative. The act itself is invisible, but its effects appear in the world, and we know it as the act of freedom, according to Ricoeur. So we have an, an inner experience of it. And so it's only through this, um, a, the effort of, of, of interpretation. I'm going on too long here. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, uh, we just have a little bit. Uh, if uh, we, we could have the question and, and the answer, uh, it's likely. Sure, yes. <laughs> okay, my question is about the body and the last chapter of the one so as Thank you for that question. Yeah, yeah and, but, and also because I, want, I was thinking about uh, Rousseau's notion of life and körper that Rico uh, uh, refers to. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that when you stress uh, the um, lightness or uh, um, too much, uh, you lose the otherness of the body that Rico wants to articulate in this aspect. Uh, and, and I don't want to say this is the part I didn't get to, but uh, the, the, what for uh, Baran, and then recur following Baran, it's the um, it is in the experience of the, the radical passivity of the body that one experiences um, the 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 awareness of acting comes in the resistance of passivity. It doesn't mean that acting is resistance, but it, it's what it's how it becomes conscious. So at least for Baran, there um, there's a almost like a unity 
of this experience of passivity and acting. It's when you're paradoxically unsuccessful in acting, you feel this resistance that you then uh, become aware of, 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 of the acting. And that, and Ricoeur talks about this in Freedom of Nature. He has the example of the, of the, the graceful dan ballet dancer. There's no effort. There, the primitive datum of acting is invisible. It's only when the body resists. And that's why um, the, the Husserlian analyses of passivity and passive synthesis are, are, are so important at that point. And, uh, but believe me, I have the same questions that you have. It, it, it's, it's easy to get, well, isn't he saying this and, and, and so forth. I, I should be keeping it short here. So, uh, Thank you very yes. much. Uh, Professor George, can we do the yeah. So uh, uh, we, we are late, but it's a pleasure to be late. Thank you very much. Thank you.